what I want to talk to you today about is public defenders, because you know public defenders get a really bad rap from the media. They get it from the ordinary citizenry. They also get it from the from the legal arena itself. Uh, they're not uh, looked at very highly just because of the kind of uh, job that they do in the law. Here's what I want to talk about. So I want to really start off with talking about one of the distinguishing features in the United States is the rule of law. And that rule of law needs to be followed to the letter of the law. This letter of the law that, you, uh, that we have is found in legal procedure. It's found in Supreme Court and other court precedents. It's found in courts and it's found in statutes. And that's what you follow. It's like fixing a car. It's one way to fix a carburetor and you need to follow the law to fix the carburetor. Otherwise, you're gonna mess up your car. And this is exactly the way that the legal justice system works. And it's all based on our constitution and the amendments to our constitution. Now, in our country, we have something unique. It's called innocent until proven guilty. Shocking. <laughs> uh, what this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean whether the person did it or not. This means that you have to follow the rules of evidence and procedure. And if a and burden of proof generally is on the prosecution, because it's the prosecutor that brings in the defendant. The defendant in this country doesn't have to do anything. Sit back and relax. Right? I wasn't the one that dragged myself in. I was dragged in by the prosecution. And so it's up to the prosecution to meet the burden of proof. And that is innocent and guilty. So I remember many years ago there was this case where a mother had drowned a baby after, and I was teaching at that time uh, as adjunct in the morning before I went to my uh, business that, uh, that I was doing in Vail. And on the way I would stop at this campus in the morning and I would talk to my classes. And everybody in these in this class were it was a Dima community campus and everybody in this class were like, you know, wanna be border control sheriffs. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So <laughs> anyway, so I walked in one morning and they were really upset with me and I'm standing over there going, Oh my god, what is going on here? This looks like some sort of a rebellion. And and one of the one of the students from the back is huge guy. Like, it's, it's lawyers like you, right? And it's because of them that she's now walking the streets, you know, after she murdered her child. How do you know? How do you know? It was in the newspaper, really. How does the newspaper know? The media said so. Were they there? Here's generally how it works. If you are in a criminal court, chances are the victim is not there. The issue then becomes that the only two people that know the crime is the victim and the perpetrator. That's it. So the truth dies with the victim, and very rarely you get it under the perpetrator. So over here, the issue is, and I try to explain this to them, did the prosecution do their job? Did they meet the burden of proof? Because if they didn't meet that burden of proof, and they followed the Jewish directions completely and honestly, and if there was even 1% of that beyond the reasonable doubt standard, that the burden of proof was not met, the defendant has to go free. That's it. That's it. That's the premise of our government of our judiciary and of our constitution. And you abide by it whether you like it or not. Because the alternate is even worse. If the alternate is where we allow these sort of biases and prejudice to come in, we are going down a slippery slope and we become like any other country in the world. And that's it. And that's what we need to understand and that's what I try to tell them there, uh, tell them that. Uh, we have a lot of wrongful convictions right now on uh, that door. 
Uh, Innocence Project was something I got involved with when I was in law school with my college professor who wrote several books on forensics. And here's what I just wanted to talk to you briefly on today. Do you know whenever there is any incident, there is a series of circumstances that leads to that incident. It's not just one circumstance that resulted in. For example, uh, I'll just give you one uh, example here. Actually, I talk about this, uh, the Boeing 737 MAX 8, uh, the two of them that uh, crashed and grounded the Boeing airliners. And the newspapers are talking about this as uh, basically it was um, negligence on the part of Boeing. But here's what everyone fails to see in these sort of circumstances. It's not just the fact that first they were trying to compete with Airbus, the 321neo. And so they anyways lost the market on that one because of what happened. But they were trying to rush it through the assembly line, this aircraft. That was one incident. The other one was engineering issues over here, where the turbofans were very close to the fuselage. Uh, looking at the prototype 737, uh, 7 and 6, it didn't quite work out because the, the body was a lot, a lot wider on this one. They also had an electronic system there that failed to notify pilots. They had a training system where the training was missing on this portion of an aircraft takeoff and the aircraft decides and its computers start going down. How do you prevent it? In addition to this, they also there was an oversight, unfortunately, in our bureaucracy. The Federal Aviation Authorities that certifies these aircrafts to be airworthy, well, the person that certified it just happened to be an ex-Boeing executive. So you have a lot of issues, and it's not just one single particular issue that leads to a circumstance. And here it is for wrongful convictions. The first one is prosecutions and public defendants. You are fresh out of law school, who knows science, you're working in a public defender's office or not, in a prosecutor's office, okay? You are in about $100,000 plus debt, okay? And all of a sudden, you either take two tracks when you get out of law school. Either you really want to be out there doing trials, or you have an office job. Now, the office jobs as a law firm, you make lots and lots of money, but as a trial attorney, you don't. So you are out of school, you're in courtrooms every day, it's your first job, you have bills to pay, debts to pay, and then all of a sudden your boss or supervisor is coming to you and telling you, you've got to win this case for me no matter what it takes. And you're going to do that. You're going to do that. So sometimes cases may not go as you may want them to go. Witnesses may not justify the way you want them to justify. Evidence may not surface where they should have surfaced. The other problem with wrongful convictions, and this is something that I did in my school, uh, in law school, actually, uh, in my forensics class, is I did a, a publication on eyewitness testimony versus forensics evidence. Never, ever count on eyewitness testimony. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can ha I can have an accident or an incident right now. I can have six people look at it, and then I can ask you six hours later, and all six people will tell you different scenarios. I'll ask about 48 hours later, you would have made up most of it because you forgot. I asked two weeks later, it's completely fabricated. <laughs> because not all of us wait at instances for an accident to occur. I'm ready. <laughs> it gets you unaware. And when you get when it gets you unaware, you don't have that cognitive and perception to actually gather that information and process it as to really what happened. So a lot of times due to embarrassment or vagueness or fatigue, you make things up. Okay. The other issue over here, that are, and then forensics is really what brought this about. Okay, and I'll bring that up a little bit as the end of the innocence project. The third factor is something I've talked on downtown campus for the longest time, which is basically being not the fourth and fifth amendment, and the fourth amendment has to do with warrants. Warrants for you. Or your property. Okay, search and seizure. And the particularities of the warrant and why that is important. And I will. And Fifth Amendment, which is your Miranda right. Okay, right to an attorney, right not to blab and open your mouth so you end up incriminating yourself. 
And generally, I spend about a day on the Fourth and the Fifth Amendment, and I spend the rest of the semester on the erosion of the Fourth and the Fifth Amendment. Most of it, depending upon which we have a Supreme Court is swinging, whether conservative or liberal. And we've had massive changes. For example, Miranda versus Arizona from the Warren Court, which is rather liberal. We go to conservative courts down the line. You have a landmark decision of Miranda. We have other landmark decisions. Ohio versus Perry. And then as the Supreme Court starts revisiting some new circumstances and issues, they definitely leave the landmark case out there. After all, they can't overturn the one landmark case. They did it for a couple of them. But they don't want to look bad all the time. But they start poking holes. They start poking holes in this. And what happens then, depending upon whether the Supreme Court is more prosecutorial or more defense-oriented, they're going to get the rule of law down in that manner. So, for example, with the searches and seizures and the warrants, yeah, you have a warrant, but guess what? I can tell you a hundred exceptions to a warrant right now, and it's going to walk in court. Okay. All the way from auto exceptions, to exigency factors, to um, full search uh, after arrest, I mean, you name it. So, literally speaking, it gives a lot of reason to law enforcement officers here. With Miranda, right, right, you remain silent, whatever you say, it can use against your court of law, right, an attorney, if you don't have one, can report it to you. Um, lots and lots of exceptions there, right? You can Mirandize a client and then go on to talk about other cases, not least the Mirandize them. You can use trickery. You can tell them that this needs a Catholic burial, you need to find the body, and there's no such thing, you've got a false confession. The Supreme Court said that's all okay. That's all okay to do. The attorney, and I've had that before, sitting out in Eloy with a client of mine, and he comes at five o'clock and he goes, Where the heck were you? It's five o'clock. And I tell him, Homeland Security tells you, I've been sitting out there since nine o'clock in the morning. So all of these are the rule of law. And basically, you have to follow them. You have to follow them to the level of the law here. That's it. So we do have these issues, and it is because of some of these issues we have, okay? For example, the burden of the public defender, okay? Uh, the advantage of, uh, uh, disadvantage of false eyewitness testimony, the erosion of search and seizure and Miranda, all of these combined together, it's not just one single thing, lead to one conviction. And so this is the Innocence Project over here. Uh, this was something we got involved with in uh, law school. Uh, and my professor really encouraged me to look into this. And these are persons that are on death row that have been there for a very long time. Average 30, 35 years for a crime they never committed. And then we actually took another case up the ABA, American Bar Association, to, uh, to the Supreme Court because when they found that they had not done this, the state said you should be happy to be out. And we were like, the lawyers were like, no way. You need to compensate them for lost life. You need to, that state needs to compensate them for lost life for their wrongdoing. That's it. So, and again, these people, they write, you have no idea. Every law school, I'm not kidding, every law school gets hundreds of letters from persons on death row. I haven't done it. You need to help us. We, at most, given our budget, because DNA is and getting forensics is difficult, trying to get them out of files is difficult, making to make sure the chain of custody is still there, making sure the evidence has not been stagnated. I think this testament you can forget about, most of them are dead, it's not going to be working. So all we have left is this forensics and the benefit of our new technology to really look at old evidence from 10 years ago and to find out that really the person that did it and we had a couple of cases, was the next door neighbor who put the person away in the first place. So we looked at a lot of, uh, a lot of forensic evidence here, uh, mostly from hair, nails, <coughs> fingerprints. Uh, we looked at photographs of blood splatter analysis, ballistics of spent bullets, projectiles of bullets, uh, looking at photographs of bodies that were in the morgue of the exit and entry wounds. And it reveals something very different, thanks to the forensics, but at that point in time, because of the combination of all of this, they were put behind bars. And so, 
there is a lot of people still out there which are on death row. Uh, a lot of people that do need help. Uh, these, and I'm, my experience has always been that I've done a lot of asylum cases for Central Africa, for Burundi, where people have been denied by Homeland Security. They go back, they're dead. So I've taken these cases of pro bono of people who's They've been raped, their houses have been burnt in front of them, their families still in front of them, they come over here for asylum, and we can't send them back. We are, we are sending them back to death row there. And so we fight, and my experience has been with most of my, my pro bono my, my cases, pro bono cases, they're the most toughest, and they're gone forever. And, and I did a lot of this, and I, took, and I was glad when basis came along, because I have this nasty habit I like to eat. <laughs> and my mom was like, when are you going to actually pull in a salary? And it's just like, well, this person came to the door. What do you want me to do? You get a phone call from someone in Florence. Okay, the person is crying. My son's in there. Help. What are you going to do? 